Hi and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross and I'm the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. Episode 83 is an interview with the author Adarin Ann Finn. Adarin Ann is the author of the books Running with the Kenyans and The Way of the Runner. The first of these was the Sunday Times Sports Book of the Year. It also won Best New Writer at the British Sports Book Awards and was shortlisted for the William Hill Sports Book Award. He is a journalist at The Guardian and also writes regularly for The Financial Times, The Independent, Runner's World, Men's Health and many others. I am speaking him, to him this time about his latest book, The Rise of the Ultra Runners. A description of this book says, Marathons are no longer enough. Pain is to be relished, not avoided. Hallucinations are normal. Ultra running defies conventional logic, yet this most brutal, brutal and challenging sport is now one of the fastest growing in the world. Why is this? Is it an antidote to modern life or a symptom of a modern illness? A Darren Ann Finn travelled to the heart of the sport to find out and to see if he could become an ultra runner himself. His journey took him from the deserts of Oman to the snow-capped peaks of the Rockies and on from there to his ultimate goal, the 105-mile Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc. The rise of the ultra runners is the electrifying, inspirational account of what he learned along the way through encounters with the sport's many colourful characters and in his experiences of its soaring highs and crushing lows, which we all know, Finn offers an unforgettable insight into what can be found at the boundaries of human endeavour. I love that description, it really does describe the book well. Are injuries or ongoing niggles causing running to be painful, ruining your enjoyment of your sport and hobby? Get on top of these now so that you can enjoy running again and get back to preparing for the upcoming race season. Come in and see the specialists at Health and High Performance, where they always utilise the latest in technology and experience to help you get back to your running best. A personal experience of mine that I will share with you happened just the other day. I injured my back many years ago, mountain biking in an accident, um, and every now and then I get pain in the area. I went to see Luke in quite a fair bit of pain actually and walked out pain free. It was honestly amazing. So head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run to book an appointment and ensure that you can run strong and free. You can also find them on Instagram, health high performance. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Rating, reviewing and subscribing helps the podcast to grow and more runners like yourself find it and gives me more credibility when I'm approaching people for interviews. If you enjoy this episode, please do go on over and rate and review. I am aiming for 100 reviews by Easter next year. I'm up to about 37 or 8. Will you help me achieve my goal? Please do. I am loving being able to run freely now and knowing that there are races ahead to train for. If you also want to get the most out of your training, email me, Isabel, at peakendurancecoaching.com.au to organise an individualised training plan. Enjoy the interview with Darren Ann. I love reading his book and I highly recommend it. As ultra runners, you will find it really resonates. Hi, Darren Ann, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thank you. Now, um, can you tell the listeners who haven't heard about you a bit about yourself as an author and also about your running? And obviously that's related to how you started it in in some of the ultra running. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I I was a fairly keen runner as a teenager uh, and, you know, ran national championships and stuff, but but gave it up when I got to university and and other things got in the way. And and I was never that good anyway. So... uh, it kind of drifted out of my life for a while. And then when I was about 35, I just, I'd always run here and there and I had this kind of inkling to get back into it. And I kind of missed all my, I guess what would have been my best years, but, but I was still fairly young. 35 is not that old. No. Uh, and so I, I got back into it. And, uh, and by then I was a journalist. I was writing for newspapers and, and kind of mulling over ideas. I, I kind of had this ambition to write a book and, uh, 
my sister-in-law by this point had had moved to Kenya and was living in Kenya and kept telling me to come out and uh, run this marathon in Kenya. And I just kind of put all these things together. And, you know, obviously the Kenyans are the great runners. Mm. And so if you went out there and you trained with the Kenyans, you could, I could run a marathon, blah, blah, blah. So I ended up, I ended up going out and spending six months in Iten, in the Rift Valley, uh, running around uh, with some incredible athletes. Uh, I was pretty much the slowest runner in town, and that included the kids and everybody. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm my a, running a... club, I'd actually just... The... Sorry, go on. Well, just before I went to Kenya, I actually won a, a 10K, local 10K race. But there were about a thousand people in the field. So it was, it was local, but it was quite a big one. And I won the race. So I kind of went out there feeling like oh, I've kind of got back onto form. I'm pretty good. And of course, I was humiliated every day on the, on the trails <laughs> in it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I have to admit, I'm actually reading that book at the moment. So I kind of know what you're know. telling me about. Another yeah, great book. Yeah. Yep. And so then from there? Yeah. So, so then I ended up writing this book, Running with the Kenyans, which was my first book. Uh, and, it, and it did really well. It caught the imagination, people. I mean, it's, it's such a brilliant subject. I mean, these guys mm. are all, they're all coming from complete nothing. I mean, all the runners come from the poor rural areas. And they're just coming up against the rest of the world and, and just dominating them. And, it, and it's an amazing story. One of the, I think one of the most amazing stories in sport, how this tiny corner of East Africa dominates the world's most accessible, most universal sport. It's just mm. amazing. So then the publishers were keen, let's do something else, do, you know, do something else. And, and I had a kind of experience from being in Japan like 10 years before when my brother ran, was in Japan and I, I wasn't a runner at all, but I remember they were all running mad and they had these races called Ekiden races. That's right, and yeah. so anyways, the short version of the story is I ended up taking my, so each time I took my entire family, took my entire family, to Japan, which for us is quite a long way away, especially if we decided to go on the train. Ah. So we hopped on a train in southwest England and got off the train at Kyoto. Obviously, we had to cross a bit of water as well. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. <laughs> there were a few, few ferries involved. But uh, yeah, that was like a, a four week train journey with three small children. Can, can I ask why, whole... why you did it that way? Well, I, I blame my wife for this. She, <laughs> of course, uh, of course. <laughs> well, people always say you must have a very understanding wife who you know, lets you go off from all these adventures. But actually, she's the really adventurous one. So when I, after Kenya, I suggested Japan, she kind of didn't think that sounded that much of a big deal. And so she uh. wanted to add a bit of spice to it. And so she thought, why don't we go there on the train? That would be really exciting. It would be a real education <laughs> for the children. Uh, and it was, you know, you get to, when you, take a flight and you you leave one half of the world and you end up like a few yeah. hours later in a completely different place you've got no sense of where this is in the world and and the distance between it and so we had this real sense of i think my kids have a real understanding of at least that part of the world between the uk and japan and what lies in between and how mm. big it is and and yeah it was you know russia was a challenge as i'm sure oh, i can imagine <laughs> Siberia, uh, <laughs> bays on a train, but but it was fun, and uh, so yeah, so that and then I wrote a book about the Ekiden team. So these are the relay runners in Japan, it's a huge thing in Japan, mm. and they're really you know, they're brilliant runners, they amazing results. They have a whole corporate structure there, so they've got these salaried runners which don't exist anywhere else in the world. Mm. Uh, people who basically are employed on a weekly salary to be a runner. Uh, so then I did that. I came back, wrote about that. And, and in all this time, I was running more and more and more. And I was, by then I'd run about six or seven marathons. And I think there was just this sense in the running world that, and I was writing more and more about running now. So I was kind of delving into different, I was getting invited to events, talking to more and more runners. And this thing, ultra running, which I kind of barely even heard of. I'd heard of the Marathon de Saab. Mm. That was probably it. Uh, just kept coming up and coming up and, and, and I got more and more intrigued by it. And then I accidentally did an ultra marathon. Uh, accidentally, uh, as you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got, again, I, I was, I was, it was to do my work. So I got asked to go and write a race report or, or actually a travel article about one of these desert marathons. It was the Oman desert marathon. And uh, initially I said, no, I'm just, 
I just don't think I can do that. But then I changed my mind. I thought about it. I thought, oh, I can do that. And they said, well, you just need to do a couple of days and then, you know, and then you can write about it. And, but once I got the idea in my head of this challenge and this, you know, this, and it felt like such an amazing life experience, more than a, a running race. It was so mm. much more than that. It was like, just, and, and this way started in the middle of the desert in Amman and ended on the beach. So you were running towards the sea five days. And I just thought, wow, that, that's quite an experience, quite a thing to do. So I did it. Yeah. And then that introduced me to lots of, there were lots of ultra runners on that race. And then they got talking to me, telling me about the other, uh, other races. And, and on, the, on those stage races, for anyone who hasn't done one, you spend a lot of time sitting around with your fellow competitors because you run maybe four or five hours. And then the rest of the day, you're waiting for the next stage. And we had these big, lovely Berber tents in, in the desert. And so you had to sit in the shade and you just sit there talking. And so I was hearing all these stories about ultra running and I just this idea formed that this is something I want to do. And also this sounds like a fascinating world of running, mm. which I could go and explore and write about. And so a third book, which was The Rise of the Ultra Runners, was kind of born on that trip. And uh, yeah, then I, then I ended up running about 10 more ultra marathons culminating in the the utmb which is one of the big ones in in the alps in europe yeah uh, which was challenging shall we say yeah <laughs> yes uh, i i loved your description of it and it certainly resonated with me i mean i only did the ccc but some of those climbs were just yeah. unbelievable um it's funny actually. i went back last summer and did did a couple of those climbs when you do them on fresh legs they're still big but yeah. I was thinking, God, is this because when you're high, when, you, when you've been going for yeah. 30 hours and then you've got to do one of those climbs, oh my God, they go on and on and on. Yes. And, <laughs> and I know. remember seeing, like, it was nighttime and seeing just lights. It looked like they were, like, right up there. And I thought, that's where I've got to go. And that was their head torches. And I just, I think I swore the whole way up. So, <laughs> you know. Um, now, you talked uh, in your book about how you felt during um, many of the ultras you did, especially that first one that, and, and, and as you get towards the end, like, why am I even bothering doing this, you know, and that really resonated with me. And I know a lot of ultra runners um, uh, feel that way too. Can you talk about how you got through some of those moments? Yeah, it's interesting because you, you're, it's almost, it feels to me, it's almost inevitable, you're, I mean, your, your brain is, I mean, I kind of read about the science about this and it's the central governor theory of Tim Noakes that basically your body, your brain is, wants to protect you. It doesn't want you to hurt yourself. So when, when you start overstressing it, it starts looking for ways to convince you you should stop. And so this battle goes on in your mind, like, you know, should I carry on? Why am I? And then the big question is, does it matter? It doesn't matter. And of course, in most it cases, doesn't. Yeah. it doesn't matter, you know, yeah. and, and especially for me, my, my kids were like some people, oh, I'm doing it for my kids. Or I'm doing it for this. I didn't really have a strong reason except a couple of the races. So, so one thing I found a couple of the races, I said, so my big goal was to run the UTMB, but you've got to qualify for that. So you've got to get the points. And I found those races where I needed the points were easier because I had that very fixed reason. If I don't do this, Mm. I'm not going to be able to run the UTMB. If I don't run the UTMB, my, my whole project, which is a, a book as well, not just getting to the UTMB, is kind of, you know, it's just not going to happen. Uh, and so they were easy. I had less of a crisis in those races, but there were other races where I could easily drop out. It didn't affect that. And I even had this idea because I was writing a book about the experience of ultra running. At some point, I should write about the experience of <laughs> not finishing a race. So I actually had, I kind of, turn my own argument on its head in, in those moments. And I was, yeah, this, this is the race you drop out on. And it was weird because in every, every race, when I got to that point, there was something, there was always something that got me going again. And it wasn't always the same thing. And I think ultra runners talk about, you need to have, you need to have, you know, the right preparation, the right nutrition, mm. the right, you know, you got the right equipment and you've also got to have your why. And that is, that is as important as all those other things. And, uh, and I, so I think, I guess in some ways I had this big project and I had the why in the UTMB points races, but in the other races, I didn't have the why. And that's why I got very close to dropping out. Mm. And in, in probably each case, it was an external factor that allowed me to carry on. And I, and, and I was lucky in that way because 
I was 100% decided at least two or three times that I was yeah. done. Uh, I like the 24 hour track race, for example. It was the guy, there was a couple of guys, there was a guy next to me and, and he came over to me and he could see, I, I mean, I, in my mind, I was finished. I was sitting there, I'd stopped running. The thing with the, the timed races is the time's still going. So even yes. though you're not moving, you're still in the race. Uh, so uh, and to, up to a certain point, I think if you miss four hours, then you're officially out. And I'm sitting there in my mind, given up and he's like are you injured and I'm like no no I'm not I'm not injured I've just broken everything about me is broken and he just said oh you, you know he said it'd be a shame to give up just when it's getting interesting he said <laughs> and it just really got me thinking oh, and, he, and he said you don't know what's waiting for you out there if you go out there and so there's this sense of exploration exploration into yourself as well into what you're capable mm. of and I guess there was just a part of me each time that that something sparked that sense in me that I wasn't finished that I could continue and and what amazingly happened quite a few times to me uh anyone will know the book this is a kind of recurring theme is that once I did get over that hump I kind of was reborn and I had this real rebirth in terms of energy in terms of feeling fine mm. and the more that happened the more I kind of realized oh actually it's just my mind slowing me down and actually I'm not as broken as I feel I'm not as broken as I've kind of convince myself that I am and so I think experience can play a role too the more times you've been through that and come out the other side the more the easier it is for you to realize this is just this is this I mean it's difficult in the moment because yes. you're so convinced I mean I, I was convinced my feet just couldn't take another step you know I couldn't even I couldn't even step down the step to get to you know to the aid station I was like no I'm not going on and then two hours later, you know, running down a hill like nobody's business. So, but the, when, once you've done that a few times, you start thinking, mm. and I remember actually in one race quite early on feeling like my knee was hurting. And I actually said to myself, uh -uh, you're going to have to try harder than that. <laughs> and then, I've been, you know, I know now, I know your tricks to, to my own head, you know, to try and get me to feel like, oh no, it's all going wrong. Uh, so it's experience. And, and I, and I, like I say, I was lucky a couple of times. There was one race where I think, well, there was one race where I, there was a couple of friends came by and, and they kind of scooped me up. Uh, right, yeah. And so sometimes, you know, there were external forces. And, and yeah, and, and so you've got you to know why. It's, it's very good. I mean, you don't have to. Like, you can be lucky and something can happen. But the dropout rate is very high in these races. Uh, like, like in one race, I was trying to drop out and my phone wouldn't work. I was trying to message my wife to say, and I still got the text message saying, I, I'm, I'm giving up, I'm not carrying on. But the message wouldn't go through. And it was because I was in Switzerland where this is, uh, it's complicated, but English phones work all over Europe except in Switzerland because it's not part of the EU. And so my message wouldn't go. <laughs> and, I, and then it said, you have to download this option. And then, oh my you know, gosh. Sign up. and I just, my brain was so frazzled. I thought, oh, it's easier to keep running than try and work out this. <laughs> and then by the time I got there, I was feeling better. So, so yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. And, and in some ways, that's the appeal of ultra running is getting to that state and then seeing what push you're made through. of. Seeing, can, yeah. can you push through this? And um, you do mention in your book that... Um, like your wife and kids often did help you get through and your kids would tell you that you could keep going. And, and another comment you made was it's not always the ultras themselves that are necessarily hard, although they are, but that finishing and being alone is um, because I know a couple of the early races you did, you, you did on your own. Can you tell us more about that? How the difference having people for you there? Yeah, that was the real lesson I learned over, over the course of the ultras because I like I find in in running generally, and I think even when I was younger, it was it was in my own personal thing, and I would go off and, and I would run and I would mm. do races, and I was in a team. But my family never came. My friends, none of my friends from school, for example, were runners, and so I I, I didn't really feel like I needed anybody. And then when I started signing up for these ultras, it felt like a slightly selfish thing to ask my wife to come along just to stand around for you know. 12, 15, 18 hours, just to then when I came by to, you know, make sure I ate some food and, and like filled up my water. I was like, well, I can do that. You know, that yeah. seems crazy. But <laughs> what happens is you get in such a state, uh, especially in a long, longer ultra, that uh, 
you really you really you get emotional you need that kind of emotional support you do actually need help just like untying your bag and things like this i mean i so so my lowest point was this three-day race uh around this island in in wales anglesey uh on the coast path and definitely the lowest point of the whole of the ultra running for me was the end of that second day and i turned up and it was about 11 30 at night and i was cold and i just could not organize food i could not all i did is i basically managed to take my shoes off and crawl under these tables in this like uh, village hall and just close my eyes and i didn't sleep i just lay there kind of shivering and i felt so alone i felt so and, and everybody else was there they had their crews and their families and actually some of them were going off to stay in hotels till the next morning yeah. And I just felt so miserable. And, I, and, and then I said to my wife, can you come to the next one, please? And, uh, and it made such a difference. Just having that to look forward to as well. I mean, knowing they're going to be there, it keeps you going. And, and just those few words, I, I'd even say to her, I know you may only say it because I'm telling you, but just tell me I look good. I look strong. I look like I'm going to do this. Even if you don't believe it, even if I look terrible, tell me I look good because it will make a difference. Yeah. And she kind of looked at me like, really? Is that? But it does. You need that. You need all the positive stimulation, mm. all the positivity you can get. I, I found anyway. And, and I don't think I was unique in that. I mean, no. I think people talk about the crew and the support and ultra running is really important. And, and I definitely learned that. Yeah, for sure. Now, you also talk about how, you know, <clears throat> in Western society, we live a comfortable life and how ultra running takes us out of this. Why do you think that's so important to, to be out of that comfort zone? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, I just think there's something, you know, we are still that kind of part of us, at least, is still this prehistoric kind of human, this, uh, this, this kind of animal, basically. And we have these certain expectations and needs. And I think uh, the idea that, we live these very comfortable lives. We don't move too much. We get in the car, we go to the office, we come home, we go to the restaurant. It just doesn't quite fulfill us. I mean, it, you know, obviously it's nice and it's fun, but there is this kind of part of us that craves a bit of wildness, a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, hardship. Uh, and it's not that we want the hardship, but we, it, it brings an appreciation of, of everything else. And, and I think when you don't have that, when life is too easy, it, it does leave you feeling like you haven't fulfilled your, you know, your essence of who you are as, as a human. And so, you know, and, 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 and so ultra runs give you that opportunity and, and they're slightly contrived in a way, but I think once you get out there, once you get into the wild and you get into the mountains at night and, you know, like you see that mountain, you've got to get up it. I think it, it really touches something deep inside you that something kind of, primal in, in you is kind of awoken and it's like there's a I think there's a moment I described with some guy it, it, nothing to do with ultra running but he'd been writing about that same primal experience and, and how he'd found a dead deer and he picked it up to take it take it off because it was by the side of the road and he just suddenly felt this kind of connection with like he, himself as a as a prehistoric man and and I think I think there's a yeah I think there's there's a kind of need for that really. And there's a particularly the more we, uh, the more we get distance from that and you can get that, you know, you don't have to go to ultra running extremes to get that, but some people perhaps need it more than others. And, and some people, I don't know, you know, it's, it's just, it's like everything that you can take things, you can get a little taste of something or you can really kind of indulge yourself in it. And, and, you know, so you maybe don't need to spend three days, you know, running through the mountains to feel fulfilled as a person. But, uh, you know, I, I think I can see that there's a, there's an element of just fulfilling yourself as, as a, as a kind of human. Mm, yeah, that makes no. any sense at all. No, no, completely. <laughs> I, I completely agree. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you, you talk because you actually have a fairly good marathon time and, and, and you sort of, during the book, sort of said you thought that that would help you to do well in ultras, but you said that you find it's not really relevant. Um, do you still think it's important to have good speed in ultras or do you think um, it really should be just focusing on that long, steady pace? Well, uh, it, it, <laughs> I mean, 
so my good marathon time that's all relative of course in, in kenya i would be embarrassed to, uh, <laughs> to admit it but uh but yeah i think it depends on the ultra i mean i think the, obviously the further you go mm. uh and and that more technical the terrain the less it becomes about running ability i mean run, running ability and, and fitness and strength and 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 if running efficiency are all always going to be a factor but it becomes a smaller and smaller factor the further you go so if you're doing a, a 50k you know and it's not that hilly obviously it's not that far from from a road run but once you get into 100 miles in the mountains you know it almost feels like it's a misnomer that really it's not ultra running anymore it's kind of ultra moving you know? and, and even the guys winning winning the races are not running them all you know it's not yeah. like no. you know you're just struggling i mean you've got to learn i mean someone said to me quite early on you know when they knew i was doing utmb he said you've got to practice walking and i come from a road running background i just thought walking i'm not you know and my first long training runs where I found myself walking up hills, I really beat myself up about it. I was like, this is, you know, what's wrong with you? You can't even run up this hill. But actually, you get to the point where it's about managing your energy levels. It's about keeping your mind clear. It's about just being organized. Mm. You know, there's so many other things and, 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 yeah, and mentally more than anything that the, the running ability becomes less and less of, an, uh, of a factor. And you do get, you know, you get ultra runners who are great in the mountains who, who you know, wouldn't be such great runners uh, at shorter distances. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so it, it's a factor, but it gets to a point. And then you get these really long races, like there's this race in, in the UK, the Spine Race, which is 268 miles in the winter. So it's, a lot of it's at night, it's snowing, it's drizzling. You know, and there, there's a very, very little connect correlation between that and like a, a running race, a you know, a 10k road race, and that you might as well be playing cricket and rugby. You know, they're that far apart. So I, I, yeah, I don't. So it all depends. It all depends. Uh, but I, you know, I think in terms of generally being fit and healthy, of course, you, running is yeah. is a good activity, and, and in training, even if you're doing the long runs, it's good to do them in to to, to run in training, but it's you've got to get the other things right as well i think yeah and and um and i agree and, and especially with the walking and i liked it in the book you said uh we've named it power hiking to to save face yeah yeah it's not walking no 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 oh no, no. <laughs> um so also um I, I like the way you found an interesting way of becoming faster on the downhills after one particular race can you um tell the listeners about that what happened in that race yeah so i mean i what i realized is descending is one of is one of the like people often ask me what how, what would you recommend uh, what advice would you give someone uh who wants to start ultra running and it's learn to descend mm. because you, you make you make up a lot of time with no more effort because it's actually easier to descend quickly in terms of effort because mm. if you're going slowly you're, you're kind of stopping yourself but I was a terrible descender. My first race in the mountains, I'd never really been in the mountains. And, and I was, it was in France and I was taking these steps down the mountain. Everybody's flying past me and I'm just like, what's going on? And actually it was the same race. It was quite near the end of that race. Uh, and I was in my second night. It was a hundred mile race. I was into my second night and uh, I started hallucinating on the mountain. It was dark. And uh, at one point I thought I saw this I thought it was an aid station, but it was like a cocktail party. Like there were people sitting in rocking chairs and there were waiters with black tie <laughs> holding canapes, bringing trays of canapes around. And, and I, I was like, oh my God, this is great. And I started calling the other runners over. I was like, it is, it's here, it's here. And luckily they ignored me and carried on. And then I realized it was just, there was nothing there. There was just a big drop. And I oh. got a little bit scared. I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm really, I'm going to fall off this mountain. Also, by that point, I thought I would have been finished the race in my mental, my mind, I made some miscalculation somewhere. So I was already a bit spooked by the fact that I was still on this mountain when I should have been finished the race, which was, which was actually finishing on a beach. So I definitely wasn't anywhere near a beach as if I was still <laughs> up in a mountain. So I was quite confused. And then I got scared by this hallucination. And I just decided the only thing I could do to get off this mountain was to basically the next runner that came by just fill my vision with that runner, just stick to them like glue and follow them off the mountain and just not lose them. And so this person came by and, uh, 
and so I did that. I just, I just basically ran right behind him. And, and it was weirdly his or, or somebody, uh, a woman appeared who obviously knew him. I think she'd run up the mountain to meet him uh, just at that point that I met them. So I followed the two of them down and they were just chattering away in French. I, I don't speak French. I didn't really understand. But they were, it was like they were out for a Sunday, Sunday stroll chatting away and just me right behind them like stuck to them like glue and not once did they turn around and say anything and I didn't say anything I was just like I just do not want to lose them and so what happened is they were going they were used to the mountains and they were going down way quicker than I than I thought I was capable of but I just followed every step 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 step, step. and it was actually a 5k of descent and they were doing it quite quickly and actually I found out later that even in the daytime that descent is known as the descent of death because it's so difficult so it was a real baptism of fire in terms of trying to learn how to descend but in my mind because it was a life and death situation I was so hyper focused in fact it's probably one of the few times ever in my life I feel like I've got in that state of flow that that people talk about where just everything I felt and I was quite tired I was about 40 hours into the race at that point my quads had been destroyed and I was coming down this hill and every, all the pain went and I felt loose. I felt easy. And I actually had this weird sensation of getting warmer because it was quite a cold night. And I just started feeling warm in a, in a not like hot, but just really like everything was working. And it was so strange. But after that ray, after that descent, forevermore, I was like 100 times better at descending. I just kind of could put myself back in that space. I was taking these small steps. I was following this person and it was loose. And, and, uh, and it was funny because then I went to the Lake District, which is kind of the most mountainous area in England. And I was telling someone this story. And he said, that's funny because there was this coach who used to tie his runners to him and then run as fast as he could down the mountain. And they had to keep, keep up with him because they were tied to him. That would be and, terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I'm not recommending that, but it was interesting <laughs> he was using basically what I did as a um, training technique. Uh, and yeah, and, and then I realized, and then you can work on it, but I think the key is being loose and quick steps. And, and I guess just, yeah, but, but, but that was, that was how it happened. It was a quite, quite a strange experience and quite an amazing one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it stayed with me, which was really what was so strange. And now, now I'm actually quite a good descender. I, I go into races and I'm, I'm one of the people overtaking everybody, which is like, wow. <laughs> a nice feeling. <laughs> you talked about yeah. that that hallucination you had. You had quite a few while competing, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, most the most vivid ones were in that race. I had I had that one. I also had this point where I thought I was coming into a Japanese town, and there was like this Japanese writing, and and that that was on the same bit of mountain that was only probably about ten minutes before the cocktail party. <laughs> Uh, I only had I had one other race where I was, and I think this is more common. I'm not even sure if this would be a hallucination, but I just kept seeing buildings everywhere up in the mountains. And then when you get to the building, what you thought was a building, and and there were amazing buildings, intricate designs, completely different like architecture all over the place. But it always turned out to be a bush or a tree or something like that, which was which was strange. And it was weird because I was running with my friend, and I didn't mention it to him. But he said he was having exactly the same hallucinations. He kept seeing buildings the whole oh, time. Okay. We didn't oh, wow. actually compare if we'd seen the same buildings, but uh, yeah. but no. Uh, so so I had a few, uh, and then then there was the race where I finished the race, and I was still having hallucinations. I mean, I'd been up by that point by almost three days, yeah. and I was I was in the shower, and I thought I could hear the Bee Gees and and it just kept sound, sounding like this one line of a Bee Gees song over and over and over and I thought and oh yeah the guy in the next show had a radio on I thought this is he was just playing the Bee Gees over and over I was thought why is why are they just playing this one line and then I listened really closely and I realized it wasn't the Bee Gees it was just the sound of the shower <laughs> so I was having <laughs> aural uh, hallucinations as well oh, and wow. my kids by that point my kids were there and they were finding it hilarious they were like what are you hallucinating now? What, what can you see? What can you see? I was like, yeah, watch out, watch out for the cows. Like, There's no cow there? No. Okay. I need to go to bed, I think. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Can you tell us about some of the characters and amazing athletes you, you met during the course of this, of your ultra running? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of, 
decided I wouldn't go too because it was so, I didn't know that much about ultra running when I started, and there was so, seemed to be so many amazing ultra runners out there. I didn't quite know where where to start. The only person I felt like I had to speak to was Killian Shawnet, mm. uh, and I ma- and I managed that by a few strokes of luck. But most of the people I uh, I just thought I'll just meet people who I come across on the way. But but then looking back and and as I got to know more and more about ultra running luckily i did get to speak to quite a few people like mira ray <clears throat> who's the nepalese uh former child soldier she was a wonderful character to meet uh and then i spoke to jim walmsey uh, camille heron who won the comrades marathon the year i did it uh and i had a great experience with zach miller the u.s ultra runner who uh I was kind of looking, I was going over to America and I thought, when I'm over there, I want to, you know, not just do the race, but meet some other people. And so I was firing off Facebook messages to various people. And, and luckily he'd read my book, Running with the Kenyans. So he was, he was like, oh, I read your book. Yeah, it'd be great. Why don't you come and stay with me? And uh, we go running uh, before the race. I was like, that's great. Where, where do you live? And then he goes, well, you go to this town, Manitou Springs, and you park your car by the train station. And then behind the train station, there's a trailhead. There's a beginning of a trail. And you go up the mountain for six miles. So like 10 kilometers up the mountain. And uh, there's a hut. And that, that's where I live. Uh, and so I was like, oh, wow, that sounds, sounds amazing. And, and so I went up there for three days. And he's a, he's a lovely person. And uh, yeah, he, he, and while we were up there, this huge snowstorm came in, actually. And he, so he went off running in snowshoes and everything. And he would just go off for like four hours he he doesn't use any kind of technology at all, so he's no GPS mm. watch. So he just goes off running, and uh, comes back and, and looks on the clock in the hut. And if he hasn't been out long enough, he just he goes off for some more and just he knows the trail. He's been he'd been up there for about four or five years, I think, by the time I got there. So he knew the mountain, the trails so well, he could just head off in any direction and and find his way home. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, I, I got lucky when I look at the people I, I covered and, and got to speak to. It was quite mm. it's quite an amazing cast of of runners. Without going too far out of my way, there's not many people I feel like I, I missed. Obviously, there are some Courtney De Walter I didn't speak to, uh, Yanis Kouris, uh Kourias I didn't speak to. But but yeah, I, I you know without just because we were, our paths crossed, uh, yeah. yeah, a whole host of people. And, and Killian as well, of course. Yeah, no, no, it was really, it was really interesting hearing the the stories there. Um, now, you, like you mentioned earlier, you did do a twenty four hour track race, and also you've done um, stage races, but you've also done, you know, hundred milers and and quite technical ones. How do you find that they um, compare? I mean, it's all the same sport, and yet, like you say, it can, can be completely different. Yeah, they're they're very different, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, so so the, having done marathons and road marathons before, I mean, something like the Comrades Marathon was closer to what mm. I was used to doing, and I did okay there. I didn't do amazingly well, but it but that was kind of more in, in my terrain. And I actually found often in the mountain races that often when you come into a town, there'd be like a maybe two or three k section on the road coming into the town, and I'd suddenly start passing people after like being overtaken all day. And I'm like, Oh, this is, this is actually what I, I I'm good at. I, I can do this bit. And the mountains was, was a whole new experience for me. And I realized in my training, I had coming from a road background, I'd be looking at pace and mileage and <laughs> that kind of stuff. Whereas I realized I needed to look, be looking at ascent, you know, I needed to stretch, make sure I go out at time and ascent. So be out there for four or five hours and get up and down as many hills as you can. The, the pace is irrelevant. Uh, the the distance is irrelevant, really. Uh, and so so that was a different experience. And then I had to, you know, I start, started realizing I did one race, one race in the mountains where they, uh, everyone had poles. I was like the only runner in the race without poles. And and I didn't know how to use them. I, I So I had to go and find out how to use poles and get poles. And by then... You know, when you hike, when you're basically hiking up with walking sticks <laughs> up a mountain, it's you know you're a long way from a 10k race, which <laughs> was probably yeah. still my favourite distance. Uh, yeah, and like you say, they're like almost like different sports, but there's a there's a gradual graduation between them. So it's not like you know it is still running and it's still fitness and it. But what I realised is it was 
it was more about the experience than than the running challenge it was the it was the life challenge it was like mm. am i strong enough in my mind to get through this do i want to spend two days out on a mountain there were times where i did a race in the pyrenees in in on the french spanish border and there were times i was out there and you just like you're out there at dawn dawn's breaking you're coming over the top of a mountain and you just think this is just such a privilege to be here you know it doesn't matter what position i'm in it doesn't matter how yeah. fast i'm going this is just wow i'm just so lucky to be here uh which is not something you get necessarily in a 10k race <laughs> so so there's a you know there's there's a running side of me and then there's a person who likes being out in nature and being out you know doing something difficult and challenging but and and then there's the you know, there's the blurring of the two uh the the 24 hour racing is interesting in that what I found, because a lot of people ask me, and, and often if you tell someone you run around the track for 24 hours, the most common response is that's, that sounds really boring. Uh, and I didn't find that was the challenge, personally. I, I found it quite interesting. Mm. You get to know the other runners very well because you're in the same space the whole time. You get to know the other runners' crews very well. You get to know the, the officials very well. And it's kind of fun. And, and I, I'd have friends, because it was in London, and I'd lived in London for many years, and lots of friends would turn up and cheer me and, and kind of hand me drinks. And one of my nephews turned up and ran a couple of laps with me. So I wasn't actually bored. I was actually having fun. But what's challenging is that I found in a lot of the ultras, what really kept me going and motivated me and kept me kind of pushing myself was I knew that the, if I kept going, I would get there. If I stopped, I wasn't going anywhere. So I had to keep moving in it kind of relentless forward motion it doesn't matter even if you're going slowly keep moving forward when the 24 hour race the time is ticking whether you're going fast slow or even if you're just sitting down and so initially i was taking well i was running 25 minutes and then walking five minutes that was my plan and then that kind of got worse and worse and worse till i was like running one lap of the track and then sitting down for a couple of minutes <laughs> and then it became really difficult to get up again because you think well i'm you know the race is still going on and 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 that became a real challenge mentally to to, to get up and keep moving and 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 in some ways that for for that reason that was the most difficult race not because it was boring but uh, mm. yeah but yeah so there, there's lots of different branches to ultra running and they, they present their own unique challenges i think do you, do you have a particular favourite style? Oh, no, I, like, I do like them all for different reasons. I, one yeah. I, I, my least favourite is the desert. I, I really couldn't run on sand. I just, it yeah, I, just destroyed me. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I'd like that. <laughs> yeah. And it was really soft sand as well. And it was just, it really, yeah, I, I was complaining a lot to myself and to the organisers, actually. <laughs> not, that, not that they, you know, well, they kind of, slightly missold it to me and they said it's not really soft sand there's like it's kind of road dirt roads and stuff which it wasn't at all it was like soft soft sand the whole way but anyways you know I, I, there was me complaining about being in the desert in the desert race which was not, not very <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know i love i love being in the mountains like i say it was a real privilege to be there and to spend that time out there it's not my forte i'm i am better at the road stuff i can't deny it uh, and and there was something magical. I mean, a lot of people in ultra running, you know, they do it for the mountains. They do it for yeah. the landscapes. If it's not the mountains, somewhere beautiful. But I did find I really enjoyed that the, the twenty four hour track race. I found there was something kind of uh, well, they call it that race. I did. They call it the self transcendence twenty four hour track race. And I think there's something quite pure in the fact that we strip away the mountains. And it's just you running around in circles it becomes more meditative more just about your own inner dialogue your inner experience and yeah. i quite like that so so i did like that as well so yeah yeah just the least favorite not a most favorite <laughs> so um what would be your advice for a beginner starting in ultras who's maybe you know got a bit of a running background like like you did in marathons and that sort of thing do you have some advice for for beginner ultra runners well, I mean, it, again, it, like we discussed, there's lots of different types of ultras, but yeah. let's assume you're going for, say, 100K in, 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 a, in a beautiful place, which is, is probably the most typical kind of beginning ultra or, or maybe a bit less distance. Uh, 
I mean, the first thing I would say, as we discussed, is, is, is learn to descend. I mean, and, and a lot of descending comes from experience, but you can, you know, there are techniques about, you know, looking further ahead than where you're putting your feet. And there are, there are other things. And you see, may perhaps find somebody who knows how to descend, who can give you some tips. Because what happens is if you go slowly and tentatively, you're, you're destroying your quads, you're destroying your legs, and you're going slowly and you're losing all this time. So I think, and, and also descending is the funnest bit of running, basically. Descending a, a, a nice trail is just, it's the best thing. And for me, it's the, it is the best bit about running. And, and I, I, I do a lot of trail running and you come over the brow and there's a big descent. It used to fill me with fear. Now it's just like joy. It's like, oh, here we go. So yeah, so learn to descend because it's fun and because it, it, it's quick and, and easy. Uh, I do just... <laughs> I have a one slightly silly tip, but it, but it became a huge thing for me because it was one of my early races. Most of the ultra runs these days, they ask you to bring your own cup to the race because they don't want plastic cups being lifted everywhere. Uh, and then you fill it up with water. And, and a lot of these uh, running packs come with these fold up cups. So I had one of these fold up cups and I was trying to fill it up with, with like, I don't know what it was, energy drinks and water and, and, and spilling it, it and struggling and getting little sips. And what I didn't realize, because I wasn't taking on enough liquid, I was getting quite dehydrated. And at one of these A stations, this guy saw me doing this. And he said, what are you doing? He said, that's not a cup. And he gave me this huge like tankard and said, this is a cup. <laughs> and he filled it with like, this energy drink. And I drank the whole thing down. And I was like Popeye with the spinach. I was just like, whoa, I'm back. This is amazing. And so ever since then, I got myself, even though, it, it was a bit chunky. I just tied on the back a really, really light kind of hard plastic, but really big cup and tied it on the back of my pack. And then every aid station I'm sipping there, I was just like, whoa, yeah, big drink <laughs> and, and I'm off. Uh, yeah. And so it's kind of, it's kind of my get a big cup and, and fill it up. And, and someone joked the other day that it's, it's kind of a good advice for life as well. Get a big cup and fill it up. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So, I like that. <laughs> Yeah. And um, <clears throat> would you recommend beginners uh, use poles? You spoke about poles before. Pol poles are interesting. I mean, I, I realized afterwards that I never actually used them right. Oh. Uh, I mean, I feel like they did help me, but I was kind of using them to pull myself up, almost like there was a rope there. And I think the main benefit, as far as I understand it now, is you're supposed to keep the poles beside you and what they do in effect is they keep you upright while you're going uphill because the minute you start leaning forward you start putting all the pressure onto your quads and so the poles kind of force you upright and, and, and they give you a bit of support as well but I was really leaning onto them and, yeah. and and so it depends I think it's something to try I mean they definitely help and you get some of the some of the amongst the elite runners a lot of them use poles, probably more than half, but a lot of them don't. Uh, Zach Miller doesn't use them. I know Killian occasionally uses them, but not very much. So I think it's personal preference, but I, I wouldn't say you have to use them for sure. And I think the main thing when you're running uphill or, or walking uphill is, is to stay upright and kind of, you know, keep your, you basically then you're engaging your core and, you, and you're not putting all the strain on your quads. And like I say, the, the, some people love them, you know, and they, they're skipping along and they, mm. they've got them going. I found occasionally they were very cumbersome because uh, I, I wasn't using them on the descents. And a lot of people do that. So they use them on the ascents, but then fold them away and put them away for the descents. But sometimes when you don't know the course that well, you think you're going up in a sense. So you get your poles out, you fix them all together. And then actually two minutes later, it was, a, it was just a tiny up and you're going back down again. You know, oh, and then you put them away again or vice mm. versa. You put them away and then suddenly you need them. And then what can happen is you just get so tired that putting folding poles and opening poles is just like another thing to hinder you. But it depends on the rate. If, if there's a lot of climbing and you work out how to use them well and you decide you like that, it's definitely worth it. And then especially if you, I found if you get to know where the big climbs are, so you kind of in your head, you know that after that A station, there's a big climb, then you know at that A station, you get your poles out. So you're not using them on every little ascent yeah. that you come across and like i'll get them out get them in get, just know right there's three big climbs in this race i know where they are that's when i get my poles out 
but uh, yeah, I I don't I haven't used them in a race since the UTMB, and and I I haven't done a race that long uh, or that mountainous, uh, and I don't. It's not yeah, it's not my favourite element of ultra running. In fact, I think I talk about how one of my poles I just couldn't get it open again, yes. so I ended up just using one, and that actually felt quite nice. Uh, it just felt like I don't know, I didn't didn't annoy me as much so to maybe try one <laughs> quite like that it kind of had half the benefit but half the irritation as well so. and um so you mentioned you know obviously UTMB is is the final race in, in the book and, and I loved reading about that but have you been since then have you done you said you haven't done anything as long are you still running ultras what are you doing now well I mean the so that was 2018 i didn't do any in 2019 and then 2020 <laughs> happened uh, i did have two lined up for 2020 so uh, okay so, so i'm i'm keen to do do them i'm not that neither of them were as far neither i can't remember even how far they were now but yeah i kind of told myself i won't do 100 miles again but it's a bit like uh that thing that the longer the time passes the uh the more you start you know you forget about the pain and the That's trauma right. and i actually I, I have this rather ridiculous thought it sounds ridiculous now but i remember after i finished the utmb uh without giving any spoilers but yeah. i uh i remember thinking just for about five minutes afterwards i said i would rather chop my hand off than do that again <laughs> and then within about five minutes i was like no that's a bit extreme just my finger <laughs> and then within five minutes more, I was like, no, no, I just won't do it again. But I, I wouldn't chop anything. <laughs> but I was so determined to like, to remember that. I think I was thinking, just remember that thought because that will yeah. put you off. But now, you know, when I think about the UTMB festival and the atmosphere there and, and the thrill of running through those towns after descending from the mountain. And also you always think you could do it better next time with the yeah. experience and you know well maybe you don't always but the, definitely most of the races i did i didn't do as well as i kind of targeted and, and utmb is one of those i feel like i could go back and do a bit better but i don't know in my head i'm going to do ultra i feel like you get as much of an intense experience and as much of a yeah as much out of a 100k as you do 100 miles with half the torment and pain and struggle <laughs> but just as much of a, a life fulfilling kind of life affirming experience yeah so 100 yeah. k is a good distance i think it, it is a good distance and, and it's a and it means also your your wife doesn't have to wait around as long as i yeah. guess <laughs> All right. Well, this is the, the book that we've been talking about and um, which I loved and highly recommend. Um, how can people follow you or, or um, you know, see you on social media and that sort of thing? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm quite unique in my name, actually, Darren. And, mm. and so if you can, if you can <laughs> spell my name, I'm so on Twitter and Instagram. I'm just a Darren and, you know, that's it. Just my first name. Uh, I do have a website, which is called thewayoftherunner.com. Yeah. which is uh that's the name of my second book but it also felt like it was a more general name and i i do running camps mainly in the uk but uh but i do other things on there i have a podcast as well uh, and a blog and that kind of stuff and and so you can find find out what i've been up to on the way of the com. excellent me. or or darren and at anything <laughs> all right well i shall pop that in the show notes thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today Oh, it's been fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank